the vice president reports, um, if some of you guys please see me if you need to get access to campus labs. Um, that's the tool that we can review um, past legislation and things like that. Also, minutes. Um, that's the best way for you guys to do minutes. Um, secondly, if you haven't received your SGA shirt, um, please let me know so I can notify the president. If you want a bill to be brought up to the Senate, uh, please send it to both myself, uh, Gregory Munzer, who's the Chief Justice, and Vice President Winslow to have it placed <coughs> on the agenda. Munzer, in, 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 in. Thank you. 
rights and powers shall become immediately vested in the same individual for the full term in office until spring semester 2020. Therefore, be it resolved that upon Senate approval, Sofia Castro shall be immediately sworn into the position of Council of Proper Representative for the SGA 2019-2020 academic year. Sophia, you don't have two minutes of your name. You don't want to talk. Um, just to tell the reason why you're the candidate to join us. Hi, uh, my name is Sophia Castro. Um, I've heard some information about SGA during the last few weeks of SCP uh, from
CA. The office of SGA. COC representative. COC representative. And support the Constitution. And support the Constitution. And bylaws of the Student Government Association. And bylaws of the Student Government Association. Okay. Congratulations.
uh, for debt service related to the parking structure. Um, as enrollments decline, uh, the, the obligations we have have not. And so in order to make sure that their fund balance is sustainable, we uh, are requesting an increase in the campus improvement fee and the parking fee. Uh, and then finally, the library fee. Uh, the library fee is, uh, is uh, you know, subscriptions become more and more expensive over time for, for uh, different things that the library is trying to do. The library is interested in, among other things, trying to find ways to, to increase open source access and do things that will hopefully in the long run bring down the, uh, the costs associated with the library fees. Uh, this is also a place where we can, where we can offset some of the pressures on the state budget and, and hopefully provide better, better services and more, more forward looking services for, for students at the university. Questions? Yes, uh, two questions. was historical. Uh, parking, the, 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 there, there was a movement at, at one point to move some of the parking some of the parking fee towards the campus improvement fee and sort of use those things to balance each other. Um, what we're, the fee request this, this uh, time around encompasses is a sort of a recognition that we need an increase in, in, in funding to support ongoing debt service and ongoing obligations associated with our national um, We need to increase the grand total of, of dollars that are coming in in order to, uh, in order to support parking. through the budget, um, I see that the campus improvement fee and the library fee have a somewhat substantial increase compared to the other increases, um, from $0.80 cents for uh, computer resource fee 
a dollar for the student union fee, but uh, campus improvement and library fee went up a uh, dollar fifty and a dollar eighty. <coughs> Is there a reason for those substantial increases compared to the others? One of the, the well, to talk about campus improvement and parking together, really, um, both of those are used to support infrastructure and support uh, capital, some, some ongoing capital obligations. Um, to speak to those, the, the the shortfall in that particular account is, it, especially as credit hours have declined, has become more and more significant. Um, this, the, with regards to the library, uh, subscriptions become consistently more expensive, and uh, transitioning to a, a sort of more modern kind of approach to, to library subscriptions, to move to more open source, to make sure students have access to as many uh, as many low cost and free resources as possible, um, is, is going to require a change in the way, a change in the approach to, to library services, to attach them more to the fee side rather than the tuition side. Um, it, it, it's either there's there's a sort of trade between doing it with regards to fees and doing it with regards to tuition, uh, and in order to keep the uh, to sort of support that activity. Associated with a very specific debt, which is the, the debt associated with parking structure. And also, it, within those accounts, there are expenses, uh, for instance, snow removal. And, and But given the amount of dollars coming in last year, as, as Ann mentioned, there was essentially $10,000 left to pay for snow removal. Snow removal, in some years, maybe we'd get lucky, but we live in Chicago, and uh, you know it, those bills between snow removal, salt, things like that can raise up, can, can raise up upwards of $100,000. Um, we, the, you know, maintaining it, maintaining funding at the level we have is not sustainable. But 
is also the student union fee going to be used to cover the debts incurred with most of the student union yeah. most of the student union fees goes to a whole lot of other things. Mostly, what I'm trying to do it, it, and, and hopefully we're, we're trying to show is that in terms of why we need an increase, why we need a change in the level while think where things are at now, uh, there are certain specific pressures that are being placed on those particular funds. Um, the student union fee covers you know, most everything you see around you, not just Aviance, but Aviance is placing a particular current pressure on that particular fee that, that mandates a, a, a fee. Yeah, one of the initiatives that we have. On program, and so that was not funded uh, before, and now we're, we're using this to the students. So as he said, there are a number of things. Do the time we're going to have to go final question. Can you talk about, just a bit about specifically, you're talking about with the library fee, like uh, keeping open access and turn all that fee talk <coughs> Sure. One of the one of the things that one of the things that our, our new dean of libraries is interested in doing is is trying to figure out ways to address the the ongoing. Well, I mean, we talk about the HEPI index, and the HEPI index is the higher education price index. Is, is subscriptions are going up by two point. Or, I'm sorry, uh, the, the cost of higher ed is going up by two point seven percent a year. Subscriptions are going up at many multiples of that recently. Subscriptions for journals and subscriptions for the kinds of things that we use to stabilize the library uh, have gone up many times at many multiples of that. It's becoming extremely expensive to continue to support collections, to support the kinds of collections and resources that we have. I uh, in the budget office for, for a relatively short time. Before that, I was in the faculty of the economics department. And we faced it as, as econ faculty and for our students in our classes, extreme amounts of, of pressure in, in being able to provide resources. Um, the hope is that what we can do is we can use, and our new dean of libraries is, is interested in this, um, is is in bringing more open access resources, figuring out more ways to get students to, to have low cost, low cost opportunities to access uh, certain materials. Um, to do this, we can look to state funding, we can look to, uh, we can look to student fee funding, and in the interest of sort of thinking holistically about the way we approach student, student tuition, uh, you know, we look out and we see that our tuition relative to our peers has been relatively high. Our fees relative to our peers have been relatively low, and we look across our peer institutions, we uh, thought this is a, a sort of an appropriate avenue um, you know, just for the sake of argument, our, our fees are um, seventy-one dollars per credit hour. This is uh, you know, maybe a, some of them, a lot of our peer universities will charge twice that. Um, so we think that, that in terms of balance between whether we want to try to do this with tuition or try to do this through, through fees, that this is a better way to align what we're really trying to do. One final question: What budget method does the university currently? Is it ZBB? Is it incremental budgeting? Uh, the university traditionally uses an incremental budgeting model. Uh, we we are we we've I, I one of the things Anna and I co-chair the, the budget task force across the university. And one of the things we're interested in is trying to revisit that and consider the way that we uh, the way that we approach budgeting. Um, we are in, uh, to a limited basis using a sort of zero based approach to some pieces of the university, but uh, in general we use an incremental budget an incremental budget model.
point, what you notice is less than half of the students in SGA are actually students that started here as freshmen. When we talk about retention rate, uh, the federal government is the one that defines it, and it's defined as first-time, full-time freshmen. So they, they create a cohort of all the students that started here as first-time, full-time freshmen. Um, Sophia would be an example of somebody who just started, because I know she was also in the summer transition program, which I oversee, uh, who started as a full-time uh, freshman this summer. Any other student is not counted in our official retention rate, right? The vast majority of students that come to Northeastern don't come as first-time, full-time freshmen. Uh, how many students here transferred from somewhere else? Right? The overwhelming majority come as transfer students like yourselves. Right? So if you come as a transfer student, you don't count amongst these numbers. If you transfer from Harold, if you transfer from UIC, if you transfer from DePaul, or any of these other institutions, that's not really what counts. So just to kind of give you a sense of the problem, or the challenge, uh, last year, the number of first-time, full-time freshmen that we have was 425. But we had 6,300 undergraduates. So 425 is not even 1%, or is it 10%? Not even 10% of the undergraduates. Yet, that's the number that we're judged on. That is the number that high school counselors use to judge us as whether we're a good school. Uh, that's the number that the Illinois Board of Higher Education looks at regards to how we're doing as a university, we get judged largely on a very small group of students. Now some of you, uh, anybody graduating this year? All right, all right. Anybody graduating this December? All right, okay. Uh, make sure you drink some caffeine before you, but not too much that you have to go to the bathroom. You have to drink some caffeine because it's going to be a long ceremony. And you'll, you'll remember this because you will say, wait a second, I thought we were bleeding students. I thought the retention rate was terrible. And you will stand there as they read off 900 names. And you will say, wait a second, how is it that we're graduating so many students if, in fact, we're not doing well as a university with retention? Because the students that we do well with are the transfer students. Again, that's the, not one that's counted in our outward-facing numbers. Now, three years ago, we experienced uh, the budget crisis. Uh, we experienced some transitions in leadership. And we bottomed out in terms of our retention rate. Our retention rate for first-time, full-time freshmen was at 46%. And I've got to be really blunt. That is bad. That is very bad. That means less than half of the students who started here as a freshman. So the other piece of the definition is how many come back one year later the following fall. Okay? So less than half of them came back a year later the following fall. Uh, it was at that point that I came into my role. Um, first, I came in as a faculty member that was helping to work with the provost at the time to examine the issue. Uh, our retention rates went up slightly the following year. Uh, so from 16 to 17, our retention rate was um, 46%. From fall 17, uh, when 425 students came in, to the following year, fall 18, or, uh, fall 18, our retention rate was 49%. <coughs> And then for last year's class to this year's class, we are now at about close to 59%. So we've experienced a jump in retention rate of 10 percentage points, which is a very large jump. But mind you, that's only for 425 students. 10% of 425 is only 42 students, right? So we really were able to help 42 students out. The other area that I think we've made big improvements in the past year, though, is in closing some of the equity gaps uh, between black and Latino students and uh, white students. So last year, the retention rate for African American students was only 25%. And that's an area where we had a huge, huge challenge. Uh, Dr. Gibson talked about this at our State of the University address last week. And we made some really intentional efforts to focus on uh, engaging African American students. Um, we had a couple of luncheons, a breakfast. We uh, brought a lot of, uh, black faculty out. We actually, did anybody participate in the Black Student Success event that happened last week? So we did a very similar series of events last year uh, to kind of encourage this. I thought the event last week was really well done. A lot of faculty, the president showed, out, showed up, a lot of people showed up. Um, what we saw in terms of the results of that is our African American student retention rate has gone from 25%, it has doubled to almost 50%. Okay, so that, that has doubled. Our Latino retention rate went from 56% to 
almost 60%, increased about 6 percentage points. So both of those groups have seen substantial increases. But that said, we can't, I, I don't think we should pat ourselves on the back because our overall retention still remains at 59%, African American at 49, close to 50%, Latinos at 59%. Our, uh, yes. So those are all relatively still low retention rates. If you look at our peers, um, like institutions that are very similar to us uh, in California, in Texas, in New York, uh, areas in New York City, in uh, Los Angeles area, in Texas near the border, Brownsville, if you look at our peer institutions, their retention rates are as high as 70, 75, 80%, which is really where we should be at. Because a lot of times people will say, well, we serve first generation college students. So do those peer institutions. They'll say, well, uh, we serve students of color. So do those schools. Uh, so they, well, we serve urban students. So, so do they. Okay? So we really are trying to get much better organized in terms of how we provide services. The other thing that we have here is uh, there's a misconception that we have a lack of resources. We actually have a lot of resources. Students have come through STP. Students here uh, have come through Break of Volante, Project Success, Wentworth. Uh, we actually have a lot of services that we provide to freshmen. Uh, prior to me coming on board in my role, however, a lot of these services kind of functioned on their own without a lot of coordination. And there weren't a lot of shared practices across them. A lot of people were, there were a lot of chefs in the kitchen, basically. And they were cooking different things, right? Um, so what we've been trying to do is organize much better and get these organizations programs to be much more, co more coherent, uh, to serve actually more students, because they actually do have the capacity to serve more students, um, and to be able to serve more of our freshmen. It used to be, two years ago, that only 30% of our freshmen came through one of these cohorted programs. This year, 70% of our students came through one of these programs. So the hope is that we're going to provide more of these very intensive services to students, because these services work. We're trying to bring them front and center. So that way, that is the normal service that we provide to students, as opposed to coming in as a regular admin freshman, where all you get is your academic advisor, no seminar, no touch points, or anything like that. Whereas if you were in Break Volante, Project Success, you know you had an advisor that was kind of always with you, was part of a seminar, you saw them several times a week, maybe you also came through the summer transition program, uh, or Emerge, and you had a lot more wraparound services. So we're trying to use the existing services we have and leverage them uh, by getting more students into those programs. We're also trying to do the same thing because the satellite campuses also offer some of these wraparound services. The good news in all of this is it actually is not going to cost a lot more money. <coughs> the other good news about this is that when uh, this summer we actually had NACADA, which is the National Advising Association that looks at academic advisors in higher ed, and we actually have very low ratios of advisors to students. Um, a typical advisor ratio for a university our size is about 300 to 1. At our university, there is not one advisor on our entire campus that has a caseload of more than 100 students. Not one advisor on the whole campus has a caseload of more than 100 students. What that means is they actually have the capacity to serve some more students, and the ratio is, is generally pretty good. The problem exists in that we have unevenly distributed a lot of students Advisors. We have some programs where an advisor will only have 15 students. And we have other programs where an advisor will have 200 students. So what we're also trying to do is even out these advisor ratios amongst students. I've heard from Melanie and others that some people have a real hard time finding their advisor, a hard time making an appointment with their advisor, a hard time getting correct information from their advisor. So the other thing we're implementing is regular trainings, monthly trainings for our advisors. Um, so we're trying to make sure that they um, are on board with this. Next Monday, we're sending all the advisors to the College of Arts and Sciences, where most of our majors are, because all the department chairs will be giving them uh, specific feedback about the requirements for their majors. So we're making this a monthly thing. Again, these are low-cost, no-cost things that we can do. It's just a matter of better communication, better utilizing people power, better organizing our resources. So these are some of the things that we're doing. I'm, I'm going to stop right there because I want to make sure that uh, we, we did stay on track and you have any questions. Uh, real quick, you mentioned graduation and retention rates. 
lot. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about who's included in the graduation rate. The graduation rate, that's a very good question. It is also the first time full-time freshman. Yes. So right. that's why it's so low, because it's first time full-time. Exactly. So if we start, to use round numbers, if we start with 400 freshmen, our six-year graduation rate is about 25%. So that means six years later, only 100 of those 400 will graduate. If you go out to eight years, it gets up to about 30%. And if it gets out to 10 years, there are still some students here who are continuing for system. This also does not count. We don't get credit for students that transfer elsewhere and graduate. So we don't get credit for that, okay? So there are some students here who come who say, I never wanted to graduate from Northeastern. I just wanted to kind of go to a four-year school instead of a community <coughs> college, but my dream was always to go somewhere else. Part of what we're trying to do is make sure that that dream changes, that you want to stay here. That's one issue. The second issue is we're trying to get students to uh, get a sense of how to graduate sooner. That's why we're doing these advisor trainings. Um, but again, the question is right on point. We're measured by a very small population of students, right? So again, for those of you who graduate this year, you will see hundreds of students graduate, and you'll say, wait, if our graduation rate is so low, why are there so many students graduating? Well, it's because they're not counted in our statistics, but they're probably transfer students. So following up on that, is there a way you can calculate a, let's say, an accurate or accurate graduation rate that includes all those other numbers? So the, that's a good question. Uh, it's hard for one reason, but I, we do have a little bit of an answer. It's hard because students come in at different times with different amounts of credit hours. So it's hard because you're not measuring apples to apples, right? You might have one student who comes in with 90 credit hours, and then she might graduate in two semesters. You might have another student who comes in with 20 credit hours, and they might take five more years to graduate. And so you can't really get a sense, even though they both started fall 2019, they're kind of at different stages in the game. So it's kind of hard to get a sense of what a cohort is to be able to measure it. That's why it's easier to take all first-time freshmen, because then you have an equal starting point. What we do do, though, is we look at full-time equivalent degrees, or degrees per full-time equivalent student. By that measure, we actually do really well. So if you take a student, let's say one student earns nine credit hours, another student is taking three credit hours. Um, together, you count as one full-time student. So together you count as one full-time student. Um, and how many degrees do we produce? So in a given year, we produce 1,600 degrees, more or less. And that number has been really consistent over the past decade. Okay? We always produce around 1,600 uh, degrees, more or less. And we, right now, we have about uh, 4,000 full-time equivalent undergraduate students. That means we're producing one degree for 4,000 students, or 1,000 1, degrees per 4,000 students, more or less, which is exactly where you should be, because you figure uh, four years of college, 1,000 per cohort, 1,000 per <coughs> So we roughly produce the right amount of degrees for an institution our size when you calculate it that way. So that calculation, again, is called degrees per full-time equivalent, and we're really good on that.
think November 19 is our last committee meeting. We were thinking of proposing a potluck for that day as a way to help my friends. What's your name? <coughs> your. Academic Affairs. Academic Affairs is also doing good in May, so it could help them that day. <laughs> Um, if you guys could make it to El Centro next Tuesday, I'll be doing a sign-in sheet so you guys could just be on the table or play Uno with the kids. Or, um. Well, we moved our deferred raffle, raffle to December 3rd because our original date was during AMT week and that kind of just got all shuffled around. So we just decided it'd be a great way to end other end people's semester and then we can throw, throw in like a... a Pollock gift card is one of our gift cards, so then that like influences them, and then they can get used for the next semester. And then kind of, this is kind of like off topic, but I guess with it, with kind of what Destiny said about like getting to know SGA, we were talking about maybe publicizing our office hours. So like we have like during a certain time, we make sure that at least like three people are in the office, and we put like a flyer up saying, hey, come talk with SGA during these hours in our office, and then that way. They, one, they know we have an office, two, they get to know us, and three, they actually talk to us. So that's something that I was going to kind of make a flyer for, and then if we can get people to kind of do open sessions, maybe we can start that, like, get it really next semester going, where at least, like, maybe, like, every other week we have one of those open sessions, or maybe even once a month, or maybe just, like, do town hall once a month, but getting people to know us is a big goal. Let me know if you have any other ideas. Hi everyone. Um, so any I do last week was a really big success. Um, thank you to everybody who helped us out with that. Um, the final event on Thursday, the movie night, we had over 90 students come. So it went pretty well. Um, students had fun throughout the week. Um, I will say, however, it was a little bit difficult to get people to sign up to help us. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but everybody from SGA is required to participate at a, or help out at least two events throughout the semester, um, SGA events, so um, in future events, please remember to help us out, please. Moving on down to CRC. Oh, the chair, Jessica, finally just got access to the new clubs that we created in each other, so we will now begin reviewing those documents and we'll be able to reach out to those clubs as soon as we possibly can. I am also going to be proposing a Senate bill um, that arose out of our COIC provisions, um, the SGA Granted Act, uh, more information to follow up that we
five minutes or ten. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, thank you, and I, I plan to try to attend at least once a month. Last thing, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And I also have a note from her. So I will post them on the SGA. I'm starting to create a list for people who are interested for the Model Illinois government competition. Uh, so you're, if you're interested in lobbying, Office of Man Budget and Management, press, the Senate, the House of Representatives, or the Move Court section, talk with myself, or talk with Greg specifically for Move Court, but everything else, if you're interested, I'm going. Uh, so, Model Illinois Government is a yearly competition where you get to be uh, a representative for the day. So it's uh, about four to five days? Four days. Four days. Four days. Thursday night and Saturday after, or Sunday after. Yes, and where uh, you get a set of bills depending on what committee you're in. You could run for leadership positions within uh, the caucus, uh, depending on which caucus you're placed in. Uh, usually, the simulation takes place at the Capitol, so you're actually on the House General Assembly floor. Uh, the moot court competition, uh, you're given a appellate case to argue, uh, where you have to create your reasoning and then go up before a appellate court to argue either as the respondent or the petitioner. Uh, it's also a lot of fun. Uh, so if you're interested in either one of those, uh, people here have done it. Uh, but if you want, if you're interested and want to be placed on that list, let me know. No, it's uh, late, late February into March. I believe it's February 27th through March 1st. Yes. That was the first closest we've had to March 1st. And it's in Springfield. I'll double check. We stayed at the Springfield Hotel right downtown, right by the Capitol. After the session there in the old capital, we're actually in the House of Representatives in the old state capital. 
the access that we have to the Capitol that weekend is unprecedented. And we're the only really group, other than the actual legislators, that get to use it throughout the whole year. So we use the voting system that the legislators use. The senators are in the Senate chamber. And uh, it's, it's a really cool experience. We have fun. I'm the advisor, so I get to go and hang out and stay up till 4 in the morning until things get done. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. But it's, it's a good experience. So if you're interested, let me know. Another plug, there is the Halloween party at the Nest. October 31st, um, <laughs> 7.30 to 11.30. Also, we're going to have a hundred house there as well. So, so basically, if you live at the Nest, the 